So I'm, today I'm talking about a bit about the topic that has been quite, uh, I would say, even hot in our group, Ranciarian philosophy, <coughs> and also, com especially as it's connected to the, uh, I guess what Rancier would call the politics of the aesthetics and vice versa, aesthetics of the politics. So I have a couple of mottos here. Music and politics have absolutely nothing to do with each other. That was uh, one of my master students in a seminar. And that started really interesting discussion that's still going on. Uh, from Rancière, the politics of art which redistributes the form and forms and time, the images and the science of common experience will always remain ultimately undecidable. <coughs> and lastly, in a city hostile to theatre and written law, Plato recommended constantly cradling unwind infants. Okay, this is the agenda for my um, speech. Short intro, runs here on politics, aesthetics, education. What makes art political? Popular music as art and as political force. Critical pragmatism and politics of and in popular music. And I want, please remember this uh, distinction of an in. And small coda. So, intro, you'll probably recognize the guitar. It's one, a, one way of putting politics in music, and quite obvious and manifest way, and quite powerful, I would say. Okay, let's see. This presentation is an attempt to understand the conditions of politics in teaching popular music from a philosophical standpoint. Even if I view the topic through lenses that I have borrowed from Jacques Rancière, my approach can best be characterized as a variety of critical pragmatism. I will elaborate on this term shortly. However, already at this point, it might be good to anticipate my argument a bit and say that from a critical pragmatist perspective, popular music gains pol political meaning both from its inner workings and from its transformative potential. Thus, I do not subscribe to a negative dialectical view of popular music that sees it as ideological machinery fine-tuned to prevent intellectual emancipation of its consumers. My guiding idea is that emancipation is as possible in popular music pedagogy as in any other field of education. The real question is what this requires from us, the teachers. Moreover, I'm not at all sure if the success of popular music education should be only judged on the basis of intellectual emancipation. There may be a variety of pedagogical functions for popular music, and they all can have emancipatory potential. I do believe that critical pragmatism informed by Rancière's political and aesthetical philosophy can offer tools to understand this complexity. So these are some of the texts that I have been reading in the last years, trying to get more into this relation between these traditions, and also how Rancière's is kind of like goes in between and lets us to know in a different way this uh, uh, field where aesthetics and politics uh, intertwine. So first part, part Rancière and politics, aesthetics and pedagogy. What is politics, and how does popular music gain political meaning? A common dictionary definition sees politics as management of or government of public affairs. In academic textbooks, politics is often characterized as involving a public interest, interest to reach consensus. Deviating radically from such designations, Rancière suggests that we see politics as an outcome of a disagreement between those whose voices are heard and those who are silenced in society. Politics marks, quote, a conflict over what is meant to speak and to understand. It's a dispute over the horizons of perception that distinguish the audible from the inaudible, the comprehensible from the incomprehensible, the visible from the invisible, end of quote. Such dispute emerges when somebody claims a right to speak as equal to those who already get themselves heard, understood, and seen. Hence, politics is a subversive activity that will, quote, make a discourse heard, where once there had been nothing but noise, make heard as a discourse that which had merely been heard as a noise, end of quote. Such efforts are always exceptions. 
unpredicted ruptures in the social fabric. For Ranciere, politics only exists in intermittent acts of implementation that lack any overall principle or law. In other words, one cannot plan for politics to take place, only wait for it to happen. Ranciere makes a connection between politics and aesthetics. For him, aesthetics covers more than appreciation in the arts or philosophical study of sense perception. It incorporates the horizons of perception, that is, the diverse ways in which we make distinctions in the sensible realm. More specifically, aesthetics marks a, quote, distribution of the sensible that determines a mode of articulation between forms of action, production, perception, and thought, end of quote. This distribution of sensible also delineates the conceptual coordinates and modes of visibility that are operative in political domain. What is at stake in politics, then, is precisely the distribution of the sensible, or, quote, the system of self-evident facts of sense perception that simultaneously discloses the existence of something in common and the delimitations that define the respective parts and positions within it. <laughs> it's a nice design. I think it's very simple, but it kind of like reminds us how anything that we can kind of like experience with our senses is already divided by the power and by the political relations. At least that's my interpretation of the picture. <laughs> I'm a musician. What do I know? <laughs> Police. The primary function of social institutions is to maintain modes of articulation in the sensible realm as a basis of social distinction. This also applies to education. For Ranciere, the primary function of the school is to sustain the police order of the society by establishing an epistemic power structure that controls the distribution of the sensible. In his idiosyncratic terminology, police order refers to, quote, a system of coordinates defining modes of being, doing, making, and communicating that establish the border between the visible and the invisible, the audible and the inaudible, the sayable and the unsayable, end of quote. Ranciere thus observes schools as a specific models of inequality, which identify themselves with the visible difference between those who know and those who do not know, and which devote themselves visibly to the task of teaching those who are ignorant that which they do not know, thus reducing such inequality. Ranciere highlights the significance of the critique of educational policing for understanding how politics finds its way into public life. In a quite famous book called The Ignorant Schoolmaster, Ranciere suggests that political acts can also emerge inside the police order of the school, as long as the schoolmasters abandon their roles as explicators and stultifiers, and accept that learning is not dependent on pedagogical structures, but rather it's dependent on each learner's ability and will to learn. Even if the teacher can influence the student's will to learn, the student's ability to learn is innate, in the sense that she can learn practically anything in the same way she learns her mother tongue, by gradually building the required competencies in informal transactions with other people and cultural products, and by grasping the meanings of things by using them in everyday life. And actually, this comes very close to Dewey's uh, notion of learning. So, um, for Ranciere, this uh, presupposition of in each individual's potential to learn, what he calls the axiom of equal intelligence, provides an analog for understanding democracy. For democracy is based on its own axiom of equality, the axiom that assumes that everyone can partake in the communal distribution of the sensible. For Ranciere, democracy is an act of political subjectivization that disturbs the police order by polematically calling into question the aesthetic coordinates of perception, thought, and action. It is an act of contention that implements various forms of dissensus. In Ranciere's scheme, political agency emerges as a function of the emancipatory, pro emancipatory processes of learning, of finding oneself as a subject with a voice in a democratic community. 
Thus learning is at the heart of politics, and so is aesthetics. While there may be a possibility for emancipatory learning in school, this does not take place in the way that critical educationalists proclaim. That is, the students are not emancipated by the kind of teachers who make it their mission to open their students' eyes to the ideologically masked social realities that prevent intellectual growth. <coughs> For Rancière, the teacher's task is not to close the epistemological gap between herself and her students by ex explicating how things are and why they are as they are. Rather, the teacher should feed the spark of learning and help each student to find her own learning trajectories, to use Wengerian terms. <coughs> this necessitates that the teacher, who is now acting in the role of the ignorant schoolmaster, is able and willing to make a distinction between two logics namely the logic of the act of intellectual emancipation and the logic of the institution of the people's instruction. And also critically look for ways in which she can support the former in the conditions established by the latter. Emancipatory pedagogies, when successful, help the student to empower themselves as political subjects, bringing forth new identities that were not part of and did not exist previously. Hence, becoming a political subject is as much a matter of learning how to be oneself as a matter of adjusting to the society's needs. At the heart of liberation is what Francier calls subjectification. Quote, the production for a series of actions of a body and a capacity for enunciation not previously identifiable within a given field of experience, whose identification is thus part of the reconfiguration of the field of ex experience. End of quote. So, becoming oneself, politically speaking, is a poetic endeavor in the sense that it generates new agency. Poetic production of subjectivity is also the core process of democracy. Instead of seeing democracy merely as a form of government or as a system of social life that adjusts the interests of disparate parties, Rancière sees it as a, quote, a random process that redistributes the system of sensible coordinates without being able to guarantee the absolute elimination of the social inequality. End of quote. So, like John Dewey, Francia sees democracy as a continuous project. But more so than Dewey, he emphasizes the uniqueness of its constitutive political acts. Okay, I try to sum up at this point. From Rancierian perspective, politics is based on dissident impulses that stem from the attempts of the individuals to operate along with the axiom of equality. The potential of such dissident impulses is realized in political acts, that is, in particular sensible events that redistribute the aesthetic realm and restates our relationships to each other and to the things around us. As such, political acts are productive, and what they produce are new sensible orders, new configurations of the aesthetic realm. In Rancière's own words, there is an aesthetics at the core of politics and vice versa. Any intervention that has the power to disrupt the distribution of the sensible can be seen as a political act, even if it, if it would not lead into major improvement in society. Such interventions are also possible in school, the prototypical police order of the modern society. So what makes art political? This is uh, from an exhibition from Kiasma, the Finnish Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki. It's from Jani Leinonen, uh, his uh, uh, exhibition called School of Disobedience. It's great. He really focuses on changing our ideas of how the public space could be redistributed by making a political statement about brands. I guess a lot of them are American brands, but I can't help it. <laughs> That's his choice. <laughs> okay. Even if Francier accepts that politics can happen in any realm of social life, he takes a special interest in art as science, art as scene, where such acts are staged. In Francier's view, the aesthetic practices characteristic of art can point at radically new possibilities of reconfiguring the social order or at new ways to define what is common to community. Thus, art provides important study object for understanding how aesthetics is tangled in politics, and the other way around. 
Actualization of the political potential of art does not necessitate that artworks have to transmit explicit ideological messages. While there are politics that are perfectly identifiable, Ranzio claims that political art cannot work in the simple form of meaningful spectacle that would lead to an awareness of the state of the world. In short, art does not have to preach in order to teach. Artists do not have to open the eyes of their audiences to social realities in order to realize the potential, the political potential of their work. Any redistribution of the sensible may suffice to fulfill the conditions of a political act. In fact, Ranzier claims that political commitment is not even a category of art. In the same way that politics incorporates its own aesthetics that is not dependent on the artistic commitment, art implicates its own politics that instead of making us aware of the state of the world, defines new forms of community laid out by the very regime of identification in which we perceive art. So, two aesthetics. Instead of conveying its political message directly, art can display its political significance in the interlaced field of primary aesthetics, or the distribution of the sensible, and the secondary aesthetics, or art-specific expression. This makes analysis of political art much more complex issue than decoding politically intended messages. Furthermore, we always have to decode artistic or political acts against the historical, social and cultural context of their appearance. As Francier puts it, there is not one way to define a criterion for establishing a correspondence between aesthetic virtue and political virtue. A work of art that can be judged as having important political value in certain contexts can be criticized as kitsch in another, as we can see from here. Socialist realism, what happened to it after Perestroika? In terms of Francia's political theory, artistic practices may be charged with poten political potential to a degree that they can help us to locate fundamental injustice or wrong in how the sensible realm is distributed. An added bonus might be that such practices can also suggest ways to adjust society's wrongs, but this is not necessary for their political potential to actualize. Nevertheless, this possibility provides art a twofold nature that reflects Francia's nominalistic belief that, quote, the political universal only takes effect in singular, singularized form, or to put the same in somewhat cryptic words of Slavoj Zizek, Art can demonstrate how the singular appears as a stand-in for the universal, destabilizing the natural functional order of relations in the social body. According to Rancière, the power of the singular to stand in for the universal is accountable for the power of art to produce a double effect, a double eff effect that is based on one hand on the readability of political signification and on the other hand on sensible or perceptual shock caused by the uncanny, that which resets signification. That's my pic picture of uncanny, <laughs> the uncanny. Note how this reflects the duality of the two logics of politics discussed above. Art, when actualizing its political potential, always introduces something novel into sensible order of the common. It shakes the aesthetic order. This possibility is the ultimate origin of artistic creativity, and it's also the source of art's impact as political force. So finally, we, we get then into the topic of popular music. <laughs> Do you still have a time? Yes. <laughs> Just checking. I would now like to elaborate my argument a bit that popular music can be seen as a political force in the double sense discussed above. So to reiterate, my claim is that there can be politics of popular music as well as in popular music. And I also suggest that it would be good for music educators to be aware of both of these modes of political or politics and to tune their antennae to better detect their particular occurrences in acts of expression. In Ramsia, the aesthetic regime of art designates a form of specific experience that has only existed in the West since the end of 18th century. This claim is based on his observation that it's possible to discern three historically distinct but culturally overlapping regimes of identification with regard to what we call art, and these are the three regimes. So the first 
uh, did not yet recognize art as such. It subsumed art under question of images. And this question asked where, where different ways of doing and making come from and what they are for. <coughs> the fundamental distinction between true arts or imitation of the truth and arts of appearance or imitations of imitations was based on this twofold question. As we know already Plato made the dis dis distinction by arguing that the only arts worth practicing are the arts that copy actions that have precise ends. Such actions are important pedagogically as they indicate the respective position in the community for different social groups and thus maintain harmony in the city-state. According to Ramsier, such ethical judgment over the value of art established a lasting hierarchy in the poetic realm that made it impossible think, to think about art as such for a long time. So his idea is that in the ancient Athens, Greece, art was first of all functional, and its function was to maintain the society. And of course, it only belonged to the free men of Athenian society. Not very democratic. Second, the ethical regime of images was replaced by representative or poetic regime. This regime identified the substance of the arts on the basis of dual principle of mimesis and poiesis. The representative regime isolated each way of doing or making to its own domain on the basis of what kind of imitations it produced. The principle regulating this compartmentalization also became a normative principle of inclusion in society because it defended, de defined the conditions on which certain ways of doing and making could be identified as art and others not. So actually art was born, according to Ranzier, in the second regime, or the arts. Uh, the principle of poiesis thus demarcated artistic genres, whereas the uh, principle of mimesis offered guideposts for assessing the respective word of these genres and their outcomes. Thus, this regime also established a regime of visibility that defined the conditions of who can be counted as an artist. This differentiation of social roles eventually rendered the arts autonomous and linked their autonomy to more general order of occupation. Thus, representative regime of the arts established a new distribution of the sensible in Western societies. It introduced a new police order in the aesthetic realm. And Ramsier argues that this order was based on more fundamental logic of rest representation, which entered into relationship with an overall hierarchy of political and social occupations, and thus defined a fully hierarchical vision of the community. The third uh, aesthetic, called the aesthetic regime, uh, in that regime, the identification of art no longer occurred via div division with ways of doing and making. So it was not based anymore on uh, different genres and different uh, uh, artistic domains. Rather, identification of art was now based on distinguishing a sensible mode of being specific to artistic products. So the artistic product or the artwork now was the hub of the center of the focus. Thus, the new regime broke with three, principle, three principles. First, the hierarchy of high and low subjects and genres. Second, the superiority of action over life. And third, the traditional scheme of rationality defined in terms of ends and means, causes and effects. It liberated art from any specific rule, hierarchy, subject matter or genre, and also destroyed the mimetic barrier that distinguished ways of doing and making affiliated with art from other ways of doing and making. Hence, art became to be seen as a general qualifier which is applicable to any creative act that has the potential to transform the conditions of our sensory apprehension. And this opening up of art made it heteronomous, not autonomous as in the second regime. Aesthetic quality could now be claimed by any work that fit itself into a specific sensorium, finding itself a mode of being where it could be perceived as art. And connected to this, art lost its specific place in the social order and became nomadic. The artification of common objects and events in contemporary art can be taken as archetypal form of such nomadic being, or rather becoming. In the aesthetic regime, any ready-made, a soapbox, a cauliflower, a urinal, ambient, in industrial noise, anything, can become an artwork or a part of an artwork. And it's not the artist's skill, but rather her vision that defines its artistic status. 
Rancière's notion of arts as life grasps this heteronomy of artistic expression quite well. Rather than merely made, artists live through or experience, as Dewey would say. Again, Rancière makes a distinction between two coexisting politics of aesthetics that define the coordinates of art within this regime. First, the politics of becoming life of art, and second, the politics of resistant form. In the first instance, the aesthetic experience tends to dissolve into other forms of life. Art becomes life, life becomes art. In the second phase, or kind of politics, the political potential of aesthetic experience derives from the separation of art from other forms of activity and its resistance to any transformation in the form of life. So it's dualistic. Art is part of life, but it also opposes life, the sensible order that defines social life. Thus, the very aloofness of art as cultural determinant provides that it has political significance. As nomads, artists can point at and inhabit new places and positions in the sensible reality. In this way, they can transform our common ways of perceiving and dealing with this reality. And paradoxically, the aesthetic regime asserts that absolute singularity of art. At the same time, it destroys any pragmatic criterion for isolating this singularity. Art just is. Artist work, art product just is. Art can find itself as autonomous, however, only by re-establishing its ties to social life. In other words, art can recycle previous arts freely without the need to be true to the authenticity of its materials. Thus, the aesthetic regime is not defined by modernistic appeal to autonomy, uniqueness and authenticity in arts artistivism. Rather, Rancière uses the concept of aesthetic regime to criticize discourses of modernism by claiming that both modern and postmodern theories of art are but, quote, imaginary stories about artistic modernity that inform vain debates over the autonomy of art or its submission to politics, end of quote. So at this point, two questions emerge. What are the conditions for understanding popular music as art in the aesthetic regime? And what are the conditions of understanding popular music as political action in this regime? I just love it when I can put the who on slide. <laughs> Perhaps for some of us to question whether popular music is art appeals rather pointless. Even to raise such question may seem like a distant echo of the cultural wars of the 60s and 70s, which were put to rest by postmodern cultural critics towards the last millennium. In music education discourse, there have been also critics who have questioned the feasibility of judging popular music or any music as art in aesthetic terms. Some of these critics have pointed at the practical nature of music, arguing that it's pointless to try to find music a common no nominator from aesthetic theories. Still, it is not uncommon to find philosophers, critics, and teachers who object the inclusion of popular music in education based on aesthetic criteria. And I'm here thinking about Roger Scruton, Walker, and also Martha Bales. While I don't sympathize with such views, I do suggest that the issue of legitimation is important for music educators to deal with. All of us eventually find ourselves in a position where we have to make value judgments over what to teach and justify such choices. Or to paraphrase Rancière, selection of subject matter is part and parcel of the policing function of the educational institution, and it's really hard to avoid it. Yet it just does not mean that we are stuck with it. Some pictures about Finnish, are, except I think the base picture is from Britain, but otherwise it's, uh, it's, it's Finnish, European. Uh, instances of uh, how popular music is uh, embedded in school mm -hmm. music teaching. The issue of curricular choice is made even more complex when we observe that there are differences in educational cultures regarding what is taken as a suitable repertoire for the music classroom. For instance, while rock music is accepted in classroom in many countries, including my own, in many other countries, I believe, such as the US, it's still uncommon to find rock songs rehearsed during the school music lessons. Even in more lenient educational system, there are popular genres and styles that teachers are not willing to accept as part of the classroom repertoire. In a recent study, Sibelius Academy-based music education scholar Alexis Kallio found out that in order to avoid conflicts, Finnish music teachers often feel the need to have to navigate what Alexis called the school censorship frame. 
meaning the broad and specific social narratives that draw associations between particular music or songs and socially constructed <coughs> notions of deviance. This navigation is manifest, for instance, in situations where the teachers have to make decisions whether to censure certain songs. While it can be argued that such decisions are part of any teacher's work, as a cultural ga gatekeeper, or as the police, as Francier would say, they may also be seen as problematic if they send the student the message that, quote, your music is not welcome in school, and accordingly, neither are you, end of quote. As a conclusion of her study, Kallio suggests that, quote, recognizing, reflecting upon, and engaging with the political processes of legitimation and exclusion in popular repertoire selection, teachers and students may learn beyond bias and assumption. They may engage in collaborative critical inquiry and interrogate who music education serves, when, why, how, and to what ends, end of quote. From this standpoint, to reflect on the selection process itself is it's important in order to maintain critical distance to what we teach. So even if censoring popular music in classroom does not have to mean that it's not accepted as art in the society, it's still interesting to focus on the reasons why at least some forms of popular music are disregarded in music education. In what follows, I will present critical pragmatism as possible philosophical point of departure for judging popular music as pedagogically legitim legitimate study content. So, we have here Arono and Dewey. I'm basing on this. Um, the variety of critical pragmatism that I'm interested in in this presentation can be traced on one hand to John Dewey's middle and later works, and on the other hand, to the critical educational approaches based on ideas developed by social theorists of the first and second Frankfurt School. I try to provide an aerial view of how I understand these two sets of ideas before continuing to more specific questions. And I go over this pretty quickly. I think you have all read your Dewey at some point. Um, anyway, um, the variety, uh, in his middle of later works, Dewey established a complex system of ideas that has been called naturalist pragmatism or pragmatist naturalism, depending on the view. Um, from the pedagogical standpoint, which is very relevant in Dewey, as we know, the term naturalism reminds us that learning is always based on natural processes of interaction between an organism and its environment. The more evolved an organism is, the more complex such processes become. And culture can be understood as a highly developed set of habits that helps us to adapt to our living environment as a cooperative, as a social life form. Preservation of human species is dependent on both natural and cultural adaptation, which means that we cannot understand human development and growth without paying attention to both of these levels. And due with resolute use of the word experience, to refer to such, such systems of adaptation confused many of his contemporaries. The word pragmatism here reminds us that Dewey looked at human life from a holistic standpoint, where adaptive systems of action define experience as unity. To a degree, such adaptive systems are based on symbolically mediated experience or social interactions, experience can be shared and understood. And what makes Dewey's view of experience pragmatist is recognition of the inten intentional nature of uh, adaptation and thus of all learning. So we learn in order to learn more, and the value of learning is judged by how successfully we can act in future situations. Or as Alison Cadleck puts it, we learn, quote, to improve our individual and shared capacity, to tap into the critical potential of lived experience in a world that's unalterable, characterized by flux and change. One upshot of this view is that learning is always both situational and contextual. This means that we learn when we aim to solve problems that we encounter in the specific circumstances of our daily lives, keeping an eye to the cultural specific value goals. And such problems are not always cognitive or intellectual, so to speak. They are written all over the texture of human experience. To solve problems is to commit inquiry which Dewey uses as a generic name for all processes that help us to cope with the world more effectively and more fruitful manner. Art is also a mode of inquiry. What we identify as the arts, music included, can be understood as more or less systematic attempts to answer to the problems that emerge from our natural and cultural interactions. Thus, it's also relevant to talk about art in singular, 
in association to do with. Whereas Rancière connects arts in singular with the aesthetic regime, Duvi does not make a fundamental distinction between the arts as ways of doing and making and arts as, uh, art as aesthetic discipline. He rather sees all artistic endeavor as growing up from the same root, sharing characteristics that define their value as specifically human pursuits. From Dewey's standpoint, even the most ethereal things that art critics elevate above everyday experience can be seen as outcomes of culturally coordinated natural processes of adaptation. This explains why Dewey, in order to understand the aesthetic moments of life, says that we must inspect his experience in the raw and observe how enjoyment can be found from absorption into everyday activity. Like other arts, music can be understood as a culturally different practice based on universal tendency to inquire what is valuable in life. While music can elevate experience high above the threshold of perception and make life immediately enjoyable, music can also make us enjoy our everyday activities. Hence, there is no principal difference between genre styles or idioms of music, or between music and other art forms, that would make some of these forms aesthetically more valuable than others. While Dewey does grant a place for classics in his aesthetics, he does not consider them belonging to a category of their own, but rather emphasizes their practical value in the accumulated and shared experience of people. Thus, Dewey does not accept the distinction made between highbrow and lowbrow aesthetic taste, which means that he was very topical for today. All human beings have a propensity to enjoy art as aesthetic phenomena, in the same way that all human beings can enjoy aesthetic phenomena in nature. It's only because of certain contingent social economic conditions that certain modes of aesthetic experience have been elevated above others. And for Dewey, understanding art as basic mode of inquiry is a powerful way to contest such hierarchies. To say that art is a mode of inquiry is to highlight its poetic or its creative character. Hans Joas has presented an interesting characterization of pragmatism as a philosophy of creative action. Instead of judging pragmatist philosophy as mere doctrine of natural adjustment or a handmaiden of natural science, Joas highlights its notion of situated freedom, arguing that for the pragmatists, meaningfulness of action is as important as adaptation to environing conditions. It is certain that such a view characterizes Dewey's later writings, where he often roots his discussion of naturalist function of inquiry through aesthetics, highlighting the importance of aesthetic experiences as consummations of human life. In the Dubian reading, aesthetic experience is a function of our immediate relationship with the nature, where we encounter its events as qualities. Art is born directly out of this qualitative encounter. Art offers a way to inquire into the meaning potential, potential of the immediate experience in a shareable medium. This explains why a painting, a statue, or a symphony does not exemplify the work of art. Rather, the real artwork is what these art products or performances do with and in our experience. For do with the most important function of art is to help us to inquire and enjoy immediate qualities as they come by. When an artwork emerges, experience becomes rounded out by a singular quality that glues it together as a unity. Phenomenologically speaking, the result is a specific moment of insights, an experience, in which one can feel unity with the world and perceive a strong emotional sense of belonging. Wherever such moments occur, the universal aesthetic potential of experience has been consummated. For Dewey, art is also communication, but not in the sense that it conveys messages. To communicate in art is to share an experience with others. It can be a momentary encounter between two persons, or it can leave its imprint in the whole society. Also, Rancière sees the appearance of art in singular as marking a moment when people, a society, an age, is taken at a certain moment of its development, introducing a new relationship between the artist's personality and the shared world that gives rise to it and that it ex expresses. Again, Rancière's understanding of the art artistic <coughs> communication is historically more focused than Dewey's. For Dewey, artistic communication is made to make aesthetic realm common thus producing the conditions of what would be called aesthetic community. Instead of only establishing a relationship between artist and her audience, 
do we suggest that art can promote community life by providing us possibilities to share consumatory moments of life? And this notion becomes close to Christopher Small's idea of musicking as a ritual where a community can strengthen its social ties. However, while Small traces the roots of musical practice to relationship between human beings and nature, his perspective is more sociological than aesthetic. Rancio's view seems to fall somewhere in between. Five minutes, thank you. Okay, about the critical theory. So basically the idea is, and now I'm going a bit faster, I'm not reading, which might be good for the occasion. It's, uh, as Adam says, cultural crit criticisms, it, criticism is important, and it should be the basis of our judgments of cultural products. And this also relates to how we select the material and repertoire for school music education. For you, a criteria for selection is always students' experience and society's values, so they have to be somehow matched. But do we also grant a place for popular arts in education, as we heard? Adorno and Horkheimer argued in the famous uh, treatise of critical theory that pragmatism cannot account for critical selection of cultural values. Why? Because it's ideologically committed to positivism and naive empiricism, and therefore it cannot help us help but to support status quo. And this is quite a common argument from the critical theory, that pragmatism is fine, but it's not enough. Uh, by critical theory, we might mean a system of ideas that aim to empower and emancipate people from ideologically controlled domination of social systems and government. So the idea is that there is always a need to emancipate the student <coughs> from the disenfranchising effects of neoliberalism reflected in the epistemological regime that drives traditional education, the police that Francia is writing about. A critical educator should lead her students to recognize links between their learning experiences and between the social context in which such experiences are embedded. And it's interesting to think about the concept of praxis, because it really, in Marxian, Marxist uh, tradition, it gets really a bit different meaning than in, within uh, uh, mainstream philosophy of music education. Also, you could argue that Rakelsky's concept of praxialism comes close, because he bases his ideas partly on Habermas. Anyway, the need to negotiate over what and whose theories are most suitable in explaining the social context of learning and how they are best used as tools to change that context is important. So, according to critical uh, perspectives in education, we really should negotiate with our students about what we are learning, why and what for. And this negotiation involves conflict between individual, individuals and society's needs. So the basic idea is to remind us, okay, it's great, students experience the society, but we also need to pinpoint those tensions, those kind of like points of argument between the individual's uh, potential for growth and also the society's disciplining uh, power. So uh, to end my, uh, not to surprise, I guess, if you have read my text, but my kind of like, uh, at present I'm really interested in how digital music culture and digital artistry in general can make us content, content, uh, contest uh, the arts as a political arena. And I think Ranzir gives us good uh, reasons to think about how to combine critical and pragmatic perspectives. These pictures are from a uh, current Sibelius Academy project, which we are reporting, the end report is at the next Ismay, we hope. Mm -hmm. And it was basically about implementing these gadgets to popular music teaching and also to all teaching. So the students were given iPads, everybody they were like, hey, wow, thanks, iPad. I already got two. And uh, they were using them very liberally in different parts of uh, their studies and reporting how they were used. And actually they found a lot of musical uses for them in, in, in the middle of like everyday music, which is interesting. Another project which kind of like also redistributes the social space of learning, I think, is the, what we call Rockway project. So there, there is this Finnish school called Rockway. It's an, an online school for popular music and it's based on videos. So these are videos made by prof professional teachers. And we tried to implement these videos to our band teaching, which is basically pop rock band teaching. And also we try to encourage our students to produce their own materials, in a way contesting the the, the canon of that type of learning and teaching. And also what Sigrid was talking about, perhaps in a different context in your dissertation, the game, musical music game or music related games as context of, 
uh, negotiation of the musical space. I really think it's really important for music teachers to pay attention to how the kids deal with music today. And as you know, all the CD shops has, have vanished. It's only game shops. Gaming is one of the most potential ways of uh, claiming musical space for yourself and your friends. And also, often it happens entirely outside our scope as music educators. <coughs> And finally, something that Heidi Party in her dissertations at Sibelius Academy argue, I think quite convincingly, is that this uh, 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 collaborative culture that's born in the online music societies and online music communities is really important for finding new ways of uh, claiming the polit political space. So in a, in a way, you can, you can examine these uh, online music communities as, uh, as uh, new distributions of the sensible and run Syrian sense. What we only have to remember in the context of critical, pragmatist philosophy is to kind of like let it happen, to let know about it, but also try to get the critical standpoint there, which might mean criticizing these societies or communities from the standpoint of neo neoliberalist theory or from the standpoint of, a, of a late modern economy. Okay, as a coder, uh, I was thinking about talking a bit about Walter Benjamin, but I really don't have time if maybe somebody wants to mention him in a discussion or not. But in, anyway, the idea is that actually the only critical theorist that really saw the potential, I think, and many others think as well, of the, the what he called the, the, the art of mechanical reproduction, what we would call like probably the digital, digital culture, digital artistry, is Walter Benjamin, and he was really like ahead of his time. And so Benjamin can be actually used as a glue that glues together pragmatist and critical theories. And he has a lot to say about the Ranciarian standpoint as well. And our Ranciari is pretty critical about Benjamin. Because Benjamin's basic idea is that the media, the technology, technology changes the relationship of the audience to the, to the art. And Ranciari just says it is the other way around. The art has changed already like 200 years. The art educators and museum people haven't noticed it. It's become participatory. It's already participatory. There's already political spaces introduced by the art. It's very interesting discussion, but I can't go in there, here. So to stop with, uh, just uh, Ranciere writes really little about music, as you perhaps know. He doesn't, I don't know why, but he actually has found some value for sound arts and sonic arts. Things which kind of like combine sonic artistry with uh, with other types of expression. So it's a small text. I will read it and then stop. It's where the ocean of sound. It's where the vast poem of yesterday's music and sounds run up against that of the needle that scratches and the amplifier that crackles, the synthesizer that creates and the computer that invents. That the fusion of the two contradictory powers comes about that of the grand Schopenhauerian background of the ocean of sound, whence all images emerge like spectres, only to disappear once again. And that of the Schegelian poem of poem, of metamorphosity, collage and indefinite recreation produced in the basis of the great storehouse of images, ultimately identical to the life of the storehouse itself. So just something to think about. Kitos means thank you. My time is through. Questions? <laughs> oh, that's not from Sibelius Academy. That's from uh, Copenhagen Rhythmic Conservatory. But I like the statue as a bass player a lot. So that's why I put it there. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question you'd like to ask? No? Patrick. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'm, I'm I'm curious about this um, it's a difficult uh, space, right? That you talked a, a little bit at the end, uh, try to make sense of it. So um, there's this issue of singularity, right? And the singular as a representative of the university, of the universe, but also mm -hmm. as in a way a disruptive of that universe, yeah, right? So there's exactly. a relationship yeah. in there. And then there's this reality now that perhaps the participatory, the, the, the you know, the, the spaces, digital spaces, collaborative spaces. Yeah. are themselves already creating this new political space. Yes. Right? So, uh, these two things seem to kind of, to a certain extent, 
blur the line between the singular, the individual, uh, as a representation of that in art, or a particular art as a representation of an individual idea, mm -hmm. right, in this communal space. Yeah. Um, particularly from a kind of a, a, a critical standpoint, as we articulated that, you know, the individual, every time it attempts to communicate with the communal, right, it's tends to be then filtered by a particular set of hierarchies and exactly, standings yeah. and therefore gets narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, right? So that yeah. potential in the singular gets narrowed when it connects to the collective. Exactly. Right? And so but, but, how do we deal with that? Because these virtual spaces tend to be narrowing spaces as well. Yeah. The collaborative, the participatory needs tends to be against this kind of potential of the singular. Right? Mm -hmm. That that is, is so, so. I mean, how do we deal with that in education? You think? Well, I think it really needs about depends on two things: how you how you, how you see the community, and of course, a community community can be like very oppressing. The more tight it is, the more oppressing it is. But it, it can also be like sem semi open. Some communities tolerate deviants, some don't. Perhaps in the virtual world, we have a lot of, or at least some communities that kind of like tolerate things done differently which is part of the negotiation. But the bigger argument, which you're perfectly right, is that uh, from a critical standpoint, it's really like you have to swallow the idea that individual acts of distributing the sensible, in, in perhaps in a way that nobody even noticed, can have political difference. I think that's Francia's point. And some of those individual acts can have like repercussions socially. And some of them can make an impression like 200 years after. And that's kind of like the risk we have to take, at least from this standpoint. But I identified the problem. But I think Rancia has built on that dialectical relation between this kind of like system that oppresses and makes us to divide the space in a certain way, and the potential that each individual has. Of course, it's very nominalistic in a way, particularistic. It's kind of like very refreshing as well, after a long tradition of uh, neo-Marxist uh, criticism which is important. But I think it's also important to remind us that the individual acts can have artistic, qua political difference, even if they don't change the world. But that's for the artist to think, probably. But thank you, you're right. I don't have any definite answer. I'm just trying to form a picture of what's going on here. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting, because uh -huh. in a sense what you're saying is that the political act doesn't need to go towards someone. Yeah. You can s simply be self-steady. And that has it a can, power. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't say that, actually. That fits very That's well in, in a Arendtian frame, when, we, when she says we do not know where action goes, we, mm -hmm. we, we are committed to the promise and forgiveness of that moment of action and that we, we, ha we can never predict or know where it's going to go. Exactly, yeah. And which, which kind of is the disconnect then between using phrases such as em emancipating our students and then the pragmatic frame of Dewey's problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that if in the continuum of Dewey within the world, it, he may, might have restructured that as problem posing, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hear Patrick's conceptualization of this online world it continues to be problem Solving? Did I just say that wrong with the Dewey thing? Dewey says problem sol solving. Yeah. yeah. But okay, so it still continues to be problem solving and not an, an emancipatory engagement of exactly. problem posing. That's the basic critique of critical right. theory, I think. But for the teacher, I think it's good to take risks because we don't know what happens after 20 years with our students, really. So we can't actually experiment a lot. In certain cultures, you can experiment more than in others. Societies are different. But teacher always have this space, this special space where he or she can create political potential. The revolutions can be really small. That's the point. Or big. Or not. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. It's time for us to move to the next okay. session. Thank you. But thank you very much.